gives me great pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker for this alumni workshop, uh, Dr. Christopher Miller. Chris is uh, an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Oncology uh, and a member of the McDonald Genome Institute here at Washington University. He earned bachelor's degrees both in biology and computer science from Truman State uh, University here in Missouri and then did his PhD in computational biology at Baylor College of Medicine. Then he came uh, up to, to Wash U in 2011 uh, and became the cancer analysis group leader uh, as well as uh, his position in the Department of Medicine. So Chris's focus has been on developing and applying computational tools to provide insight into the origins and progression of cancer, in particular looking at the clonal architecture of tumors and how they evolve in response to therapy. Uh, he's made a number of important contributions to the open source software that's available uh, for people to do this interpretation and visualization of genomic data for this purpose. And um, to me, it's really uh, both enlightening and important to get a chance to see Chris's perspective on genomics. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I uh, have many students in uh, my um, GEP course who are interested in health sciences. Uh, and listening to Dr. Miller, they learn that genomics is really uh, essential to the practice uh, of good medicine, particularly when it comes to cancer. I think of cancer as a genetic disease of somatic cells, which sounds a little bit contradictory, but wait till you've heard Chris's lecture and that'll become clearer. And I think it is very useful for the students to see uh, how the uh, tools of genomics and how this uh, approach is really making a difference in medicine it really helps them see uh, a broader perspective uh, to what we're doing. The topic, of course, also lends itself to thinking about variant calling uh, and uh, has some links there to curriculum that Abby Harris has been uh, developing uh, for some of her students. Uh, so there are a lot of connections here to the field. Uh, it's also fascinating just to see the progress that's been made. So without taking any more time, let me turn it over to Chris. All right, thank you. Um, certainly, I would like this to be as interactive as possible. So, um, you know, you all have suffered through uh, most of a year of teaching a lot of Zoom courses, I imagine. So please hop in with your questions um, either here. I'll try to have the chat box up or I think Wilson's going to monitor it as well and, and let me know if there are any uh, pressing questions. And without uh, any more chat about that, let's get rolling. Um, so the first question we should maybe think about answering is, you know, why do we care about genetic variants? And and the answer is different for a lot of folks. Um, if you're studying, uh, you know, different model organisms, studying uh, ecology or evolution, you know, you care about population differences, evolutionary histories of variances, or um, or just understanding the fundamental biology of why changing a proline to a lysine at this particular amino acid changes the function of a gene. And I think those are all uh, massively important questions and, and worthy of study, but um, it's not what motivates me day to day because of, of what I study cancer. And the primary thing that I'm focused on is understanding human disease um, and, and specifically cancer um, and, and really trying to translate that um, understanding of cancer into personalized genomic medicine. So how we can you know, take, take the particular genomic profile of a person and, um, and uh, translate that into better care. And so there's several types of variants that we have to consider there, as, as Ellie already talked a little bit about, um, the idea that there are these germline or inherited mutations that can affect predisposition or cancer risk. Um, BRCA1 and 2 are the most famous examples of those. Um, you know, if you have them, you have a very high likelihood of uh, having breast cancer before the, you know, by the time you hit 60 or so, the, the risk is, is quite high. And it's what leads people like Angelino Gilli famously to get a double mastectomy to, to ward off that chance um, after she had tested positive for mutations in the BRCA genes. Um, and then the other flip side of that is the somatic mutations, which are the ones that um, usually end up actually driving the cancer. Um, you know, you're playing with a stack deck if you already contain one of these mutations, but usually you require between two to five mutations to kind of tip a cell into this kind of unrestrained growth phenotype, which is what characterizes cancer. Um, and that can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, we certainly think a lot about uh, UV light coming in, um, damaging skin cells, um, predisposing to melanoma. 
Um, you think a lot about uh, uh, you know, carcinogens, things like smoke or exposure to, uh, to different chemicals. But what people don't think about all that often is just DNA replication. Every time your cells divide, um, they introduce on average about three mutations because the polymerases don't have perfect fidelity. And over a lifetime of cell divisions, that adds up. Um, and so we're all playing this kind of genetic lottery where, where the prize is, is cancer and, and uh, you want to avoid that to the extent possible. Um, so it helps to kind of, I think, frame this discussion about, you know, why we care about these variants to think about um, how we're, we're applying it to cancer. And, and to do that, it, it, I think, helps to take a step back and think about what cancer treatment was like in a pre-genomics era, which is not really that long ago. And honestly, for many kinds of cancer is still the rule um, where, where we don't have kind of good targeted treatments. But, but what happens is you go in, um, you're diagnosed with cancer. Uh, somebody looks at some cells under a microscope, maybe does some pathology, uh, maybe even, you know, uh, uses an antibody test or two to tell whether you have overexpression of a particular gene um, or protein. Um, and, and then they kind of go off their list of possible um, therapies and, and choose one. Now, uh, you know, these treatments aren't, um, aren't particularly pleasant. You know, most of them are chemotherapy or radiation, which are killing lots of cells. It's just that they kill the cancer cells a little bit faster than the rest of them in theory. Um, and so we wanna minimize the number of treatments we have to try. And, and also, cause we wanna clear the cancer as quickly as possible before it metastasizes and causes bigger problems. Um, so the typical uh, process is you choose a treatment, you try it out, see if it works. Um, if they don't respond to that in a month or two, you try another treatment and so on. You go down the line. Um, and it's a really inefficient way to kind of pair people up with therapies. Um, it's a lot of guesswork involved. What we're trying to do is change that. And this really started back about 20 years ago. When we were first able to sequence, you know, kind of candidate gene lists, even though it was still fairly expensive, we could take, you know, five or 10 genes that we thought might be important for a particular type of cancer. Um, sequence them in a large collection of patient samples. So people who responded well and people who didn't respond well to certain therapies. Um, and it's for an example of this, um, I, I like to talk about never smoke or lung cancer. This is a paper that came out in 2004. And one of the genes they sequenced in this targeted panel was EGFR. It's a growth factor receptor. And that has an obvious connection to the way that um, mutations uh, might induce growth in cells, right? Unrestrained growth is the, the hallmark of cancer. Um, and so when we sequenced them, we found all these mutations in the tyrosine kinase domain of this particular uh, gene, which was maybe not completely surprising. Um, uh, you know, you, you see this frequently in cancer. It's a sign of positive selection that, you know, these cells have a growth advantage because they have a mutation there. Um, but what is really interesting is when you start marrying that with the clinical data and say, um, these patients got a particular drug in this trial, a drug called IRISA that was under development. Um, and what was fascinating is that 80% of the people who responded to that drug had EGFR mutations. Now that may tell you something about the mechanism of the drug or the fundamental biology, but what I think is even more fascinating is when you flip that on its head. If I'm a doctor and I wanna know whether to prescribe you IRISA, I sure as heck wanna know if you have an uh, EGFR mutation or not. I think that's, and, and that really in a nutshell is the purpose of, of personalized medicine. To, to find the underlying causes of the cancer so that we can treat it appropriately. So give you the right treatment to the right patients at the right time. And that's super important in cancer because cancer isn't a single disease. It's many thousands of diseases. A breast cancer is not a breast cancer is not a breast cancer. Um, they all have different combinations of underlying causative mutations. And so um, we're gonna need dozens of different therapies for each cancer type. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons that some cancers are eminently curable right now, and, and many of them are still quite deadly. And so what's really spurred the, this ability to kind of bring this idea of genomic medicine into reality is, is really the cost of sequencing dropping has been the fundamental techno technological um, uh, change that has enabled this. Um, You've probably all seen this graph before where the cost of sequencing takes a nosedive around 2006 and vastly outstrips even Moore's law um, to give us very cheap sequencing around $1,000 for a whole genome, a little less than that these days. Um, a quick aside, I went to the NCBI or NHGRI site the other day to, to pull an updated version of this graph and I was horrified to see that they went in and um, made it three-dimensional for no particular reason and uh, did some awful data viz. Um, so 
Uh, I'm going to have to pull down the raw data and make a new graph myself, but it's kind of plateaued in recent years, but it's still qu quite cheap. Uh, quick question in the chat. I see Cole says, in essence, for cancer treatment, we're trying to achieve the same type of knowledge that allows us to treat colds, flu with extreme accuracy and precision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't want a pathologist, you know, saying my cells look funny under a microscope. Um, I want to know what the underlying genomic cause is and really target that directly. That's the goal. So let's talk a little bit about what kind of enabled this huge drop in sequencing uh, costs. Um, I'm not going to go deep into the technology, but to just give you a quick overview. Um, Selexa, uh, originally now known as Illumina Sequencing, was uh, came to market in about 2006, and they did some clever little tricks, really, with chemistry to, you know, attach these adapters to DNA, put them on a glass slide, and then amplify them all in a place. You get a bunch of molecules all in the same place that have the same DNA uh, uh, sequence. And with those in place, then you can do things like flow fluorescently labeled nucleotides over one at a time, watch them with a very sensitive camera and some crazy Im image stabilization techniques and so on, um, and watch as these are incorporated one at a time, and then just follow them, right? You get a cytosine here is green, an adenine in the next cycle, a thymine in the next cycle, and so on, and read off the, the base pairs. That turns out to scale extremely well. Um, what the typical Illumina sequencing experiment looks like is a paired end sequencing experiment where you take your DNA, you chop it up, you get these little fragments out, usually about 400 base pairs, and you sequence in from both sides of the end. So you get paired end reads. Um, this turns out to be really important when trying to figure out where they came from in the genome because we have a lot of repetitive sequence in our genome. And so having 150 base pairs isn't amazing, but if I have 150 base pairs and I know that there's another 150 base pairs I know the sequence of that's close by, I have much better ability to map to the genome. And most of what you see will be 151 base pair uh, Illumina paired end sequencing these days. That said, they're not the only game in town. Um, there are other uh, places uh, doing sequencing. Pacific Biosciences was kind of the next one on the scene, and they have a fundamentally different technology. I think if Illumina is mainly chemistry, PacBio is really almost physics. Um, their, their kind of core technological advance was this ability to design these uh, tiny, tiny micro wells, and at the bottom of each one, attach a DNA polymerase that's been specially modified. Um, and so what happens in these micro wells is a single strand of DNA gets dropped into the micro well just by diffusion, gets starts chewed up by this polymerase and, and the second C, uh, strand is gets synthesized. And as it does it, it releases these fluorophores that are attached to the nucleotides. And um, we can actually watch single molecules being sequenced in real time um, by shining a laser on that. Um, so, so really cool. And when you watch the signal, you can see that, you know, an adenine is incorporated, you see a bump in the signal here, and a thiamine here and so on. Um, PacBio's, um, core advantage is that they have very long reads. Um, we're not limited to 150 base pairs. We're talking, you know, two orders of magnitude larger than that with mean lengths around 10 kb in some preps. Um, and, and reads, you know, uh, this is a little bit outdated, over 100 kilobases. So, so massively longer. And, and this turns out to be really important in some contexts. You know, it's, it's more expensive and it's got a much higher base error rate per base, but the fact that you're getting so many bases makes it amazing for kind of scaffolding where you kind of uh, do de novo assemblies. Um, and, you know, when you want to kind of get the lay of the land and then fill in the gaps with Illumina or fill in the exact base pair sequences is, is a common kind of paradigm. Um, also important for uh, finding structural variants, which can be very hard to map with short reads, um, especially if they ends fall into repetitive sequences and such. Um, and then the third kind of major player in the sequencing stage right now is something called Oxford Nanopore. And if Illumina was chemistry and PacBio was physics, this is almost electrical engineering. Because um, what they're doing here is they've, they've attached a porin molecule to a bed of silicon, and uh, you can measure the current precisely that flows through each one of these pores. So as a strand of DNA is sucked through these pores, um, they, the cytosines, thymines, adenines, and guanines all take up a different amount of space and impede that current to a different amount and change the electrical signal. And you can monitor that in real time with, you know, silicon going to each one of these pores. 
um, and watch the Z impedance change and then infer which base goes in. It can even infer whether a cytosine was methylated or not because that's a little bit different, you know, shape, has a little bit of extra uh, impedance there. And so um, these are super portable. Um, they, this is a little stick about the size of a pack of big chewing gum. Um, it plugs right into the computer and you get about 2000 nanopores per. Um, so their throughput isn't super high, but it's fantastic for doing certain types of diagnostic tests. Um, they also have very long reads and they're using that in some kind of genome assembly um, uh, applications, but, but they're also useful for just getting long reads to, to do uh, or so for uh, being portable and being able to take them out into uh, places where you don't have kind of traditional sequencing infrastructure um, and you can sequence right from your laptop. And in fact, they've sent these to space and done DNA sequencing because it only depends on, you know, being able to pull a current through. There's no gravity, no microscopes, um, you know, no, no image stabilization. They're rugged and uh, ready to go, which, which makes them pretty cool. So those are the three types of sequencing you're, you're typically going to see these days, either short read sequencing from Illumina or long reads from Oxford or Pacific Biosciences, and they kind of each have their role to play. Uh, somebody asked, are there algorithms that align these newly generated sequences? Absolutely. Um, so a uh, whole new class of algorithms had to be developed because the signals that come out of an Illumina machine look very different. Uh, with microscopy look very different from these that come out from PacBio or Oxford Nanopore. And so a whole new set of aligners, a whole new set of base callers to even get to the, the reads in the first place, and a whole new set of uh, tools for dealing with very long reads, um, which have just fundamentally different uh, characteristics when you're trying to piece the genome back together. So now we've got some ways to get the sequence and the next step is to sequence all the things, right? Um, it sounds easy, um, but uh, in practice is maybe not so easy um, because having the sequence isn't enough. Um, you know, I can hand you a pile of FASTQs with raw reads and then you've got to do something with them. And that's, that's where, you know, some of the work has come in over the past, you know, 15 years or so. Um, you get this pile of short reads coming out the sequencer. I'm gonna mostly talk about Illumina today. Um, and you've got to do some stuff with them. The first step is to map them to a genome reference, right? You need to figure out where they came from and kind of piece together um, the puzzle. Um, but, but this itself comes with caveats. So one of the questions about genome mapping to a genome reference is whose genome are we mapping against? And it turns out the human reference was mostly put together from a single male in Buffalo, New York, who answered a newspaper ad back in the 90s. Um, and, and we know that there's significant diversity within the human population. We all harbor differences, you know, about 3 million SNPs per person in DELs. We also harbor thousands of structural variants, which are big blocks of DNA that are different between us. Um, this was a recent study coming out of WashU showing just common SVs in the population. We all have typically, you know, well over a thousand of some of these different categories, deletions, duplications, inversions, and so on which means that there are many, many megabases of our genome that are different from person to person. And that complicates things when you're trying to align this data. Um, I may have sequence coming from my genome that doesn't exist in the reference. And so those reads either get discarded or mismapped sometimes. And that and that's complicates things. Um, furthermore, the reference is incomplete. I don't know most people realize this, but you know, about 8% of the genome is highly repetitive sequence that they're just unable to access with technologies um, that were used in either building the original re uh, reference or in refining it over time. Um, so they put together a consortium called the telomere to telomere consortium that's going to use some of these long read technologies to change that. And actually, it's, it's great timing because about two weeks ago, they came out with a paper that has one of those classic understated titles, um, the complete sequence of a human genome. Um, where they did, they took these long reads and went telomere to telomere um, on a, it was actually a haploid um, kind of cell line, um, but uh, went, you know, every single base pair in those sequences is, is, is represented. And, and that's pretty an amazing advance. And I think it's going to um, work its way into kind of common usage over the next few years. Um, what's it gonna be even past that, kind of the, the next stage of human genome is more accurately representing the diversity within the genome and so that's where the idea of doing kind of graph genomes comes in. <clears throat> so instead of just having a linear sequence and say, this is our reference and we're gonna map against it, you try to encapsulate the diversity within the genome. 
So, um, you know, we know that some populations have a T here and some have a C here. Some, you know, everyone's got a TA at this location and so on. And so uh, an alignment against this graph genome then becomes a path through this graph. Now, obviously that becomes uh, massively complicated in terms of the data structures you use to store this information. It's a lot harder than just a text file, which is what our human reference is right now. And the algorithms needed to map against it get um, massively more com complex for that reason. So we are, uh, uh, I think, you know, it's still a very raw technology and there's still a lot of technology development going on in this space. But in a decade, I fully expect that we'll be aligning against a kind of pan-human genome and the same from all other species as well that kind of represents diversity within the populations in a more accurate way. And as a result, gives us better results out the other side, better variant calls, better mappings, and so on. All right, so that's, we're like 30 slides in and we've just gotten to mapping. Um, so, so let's talk about variants a little bit and what kinds we can do once we have our, our reads map and, and how we go about accomplishing that. Um, to start, I'm gonna talk about sequence variation, which is typically like small events, SNPs, so single base pair changes or insertions or deletions, um, You know, typically under I'd say 30 or so base pairs or, or what kind of are considered in this range. Um, and so figuring out how to do those is not as straightforward as just looking at your alignments and comparing them with the reference genome because we're dealing with messy data at the end of the day. And there are all sorts of artifacts we have to look out for. Um, one thing that happens a lot in Illumina sequencing in particular is that you get duplicate reads. These can be from PCR steps that happen up front or they can happen from like cluster amplification issues on the sequencer itself. Um, but what can happen is you see a case like this where I see a variant, I've got four C's here, they're different from my reference, maybe everything else matches. And if I just count up reads, those look like a really nice clean variant. I've got 50% of my reads that have this variant, looks like a heterozygous hit. Um, but if you do closer and do your deduplication and kind of clean up what looks like a PCR error, because each of these reads is exactly identical, which is fairly unlikely in a standard sequencing experiment, you see that I've only got one base left. And so you know, that looks a lot more like maybe a random error than, than a true variant. And so the stats behind doing some of this stuff are, are quite involved and quite important because sequencing errors are quite difficult. This is more examples of kind of a clean variant. So we've got a reference genome here. Each of these gray bars is reads. They're aligned against it in the IGV viewer. And you can see here's a real variant. It's a heterozygous hit different from the um, uh, reference genome in approximately 50% of the reads, just like you'd expect. And you can see scattered through here errors. And those are fairly frequent. Um, and we're able to ignore those because we do deep sequencing and, and sample from lots of different molecules. Um, but you, know, you don't always have that luxury. You may have um, low depth sequencing where those errors are much harder to distinguish from truth. Um, you may have more systematic errors that aren't just one-offs. So this is an example of um, PCR amplification uh, having strand bias in the prep where you see all these pileups of reads that look like they would be clean variants, but it's really because there's this weed hole, weird whole polymer tract here. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, when you sequence it from this side, the polymerase kind of chokes and stutters and, and gives you an extra base or two there, but reads going the other way don't have it. Um, and then there's, you know, reads of, due to porology too. Um, some uh, portions of the genome, because they're almost identical genes scattered throughout the genome, um, are poorly assembled in the reference, or, or sometimes you just get mismappings between them. Um, and that can cause, you know, systematic errors where you see lots and lots of uh, mutations in single reads because they actually come from not that gene, but a parallel that might not even be represented in the genome. And we know lots of these genes exist and we kind of blacklist some of them that we use. Um, but sure would be better if we could do a better job of representing them, clean up our variant calls. And that's some of the impetus between all the uh, kind of reference genome work that's going on. So, so variant calling is a complex process. And anybody who tells you that it's a solved problem has probably never tried to actually call variants and get down in the weeds. Um, that said, we're getting pretty good at it. You know, there's some pretty good tools out there these days. Um, but but their goals are, are are to you know sensitively detect mutations at the end of the day but perhaps even more importantly is to precisely detect mutations so we've got all these different error models we just talked about a few of them um 
And, and we need to deal with those appropriately and not call false positives when they occur. And, and the FDR has to be astonishingly low. So the false discovery rate of only 0 0.001 when you're querying 3.2 billion bases gives you 3.2 million false positives. You know, we'd all be happy with this in most of our experiments, but it just doesn't cut it when you're doing this kind of scale. Um, and so most of what we've been talking about so far has been germline variation. Where we're just taking the sequence and comparing it. Um, there's another the complication in cancer, which is that we are often doing somatic sequencing where we compare a person's tumor sequence to their normal sequence, because that's the easiest to find way to find out what's unique, not against the reference genome, but what's unique to the tumor, because those are the likely events that are driving the cancer. It allows us to narrow our search from those 3.2 million differences to you know, something that's many orders of magnitude lower. Um, and you can see, you know, here in this uh, IGB screenshot, there's a germline variant here, which is present in both normal and tumor. And here's a somatic mutation, kind of a complex deletion with uh, some base changes here, but it's completely absent in the normal. And so, you know, that's a potential driver event in the cancer. It might also be a passenger. I saw that in the cat chat earlier. Um, and, and it's definitely one of the challenges in cancer genomics is once we have these variants, figuring out which ones are truly driving it and, and which aren't. And, and so recurrence gets you some of the way there. Um, but there's also, um, you know, uh, lots of complications where, you know, some sites in the genome are just more mutable than others um, and, and so on. So, so teasing out that difference between passenger and driver mutations is definitely one of the challenges that's consumed a lot of people over the last, say, five to 10 years and will continue to do so um, uh, as they move into kind of like biological validation of potential drivers. Somatic um, variant calling <clears throat> in cancer comes with other challenges as well, um, because tumors carry um, um, are more problematic to sequence for many reasons. Um, they're often impure, so uh, you may not have not just your tumor tissue here, but you may have a bunch of normal contamination from surrounding tissue. And so my signal might not be in like half the reads for a heterozygous variant. It might only be in 10%. Um, you know, tumors may be aneuploid. So you could have uh, many copies of a particular gene or one copy or none. Um, and you know, your variant caller and your underlying stats has to contend with that. It can't kind of rely on the fact that um, I should either be heterozygous or homozygous. That complicates matters and, and may require deeper sequencing as a result. Um, and, and then tumor heterogeneity, which is something that I study a lot. Um, which is the idea that tumors are genetically diverse collections of cells. And I think that's worth taking a little detour into for a minute, because it's an interesting idea that, that not many people think about. But once your tumor is off to the races, it's a collection of cells that's growing and dividing and expanding, just like, say, a bacterial population. Um, and so they're acquiring new mutations as they grow. And so you have competition between these cells for fitness. Um, and, and so important variants may be subclonal in here. Um, I like to show this plot, um, which is from one from our early papers in AML, where we kind of trace the life cycle of a, of a tumor and sequenced it here, both at presentation and at relapse, and then kind of diagramic, uh, uh, made this diagram of, of what it might look like. Um, and so you start with a single cell, which acquires a handful of mutations that tip it into cancer, and it starts to grow. Um, and then as that tumor grows, you get additional hits sometimes. So here in orange, it's represented a hit that gave this particular cell increased fitness and it began to expand. Um, and here's another one in purple. And so, you know, when we sequence, we get a cross section through these cells. We're, we're taking a sampling of a large population. And so these variants here in purple or orange only make up a small percentage of the cells that we're sequencing. So we've got to be able to detect really rare stuff, but we want to find all these cell subclones, especially because they might be the most important ones. Because when we, when we introduce a chemotherapy bottleneck here, um, most of these subclones die off. Um, what we're left through is this orange one, which was only a small percentage of the tumor, which passes through and ends up causing the relapse in the end after acquiring additional mutations. And so, um, so really understanding tumors not just uh, broadly, but deeply to find this rare stuff is, is super important. All right, so um, so that's kind of talking a little bit about sequence variants. Um, there's also a whole, uh, whole uh, world out there of, of structural variation as well. Um, 
let me let me back up a second. Um, people are talking about single cell sequencing here in the chat. Um, also a super important technology. We're using lots of that, especially in, in RNA-seq, um, to try to um, tease apart these subclones. Um, so it's it's cool that we can, you know, genomically sequence and find out that there are different populations, but presumably these populations have different expression patterns too, right? These mutations are, um, you know, uh, this change isn't manifesting itself at the mutational level. It's causing rewired you know, responses to either chemotherapy or to growth factor signals or whatever else. And understanding those at the expression or even the proteomics level at some point, uh, we may get there as that technology matures, um, is going to be really important for understanding why this really rare population of cells manages to, to squeak through and to understanding how we can find and recognize these at diagnosis and maybe treat them before the relapse and, and make sure we eliminate all the subclones. So yeah, single cell is, is a cool technology that we're thinking a lot about these days. Um, as far as types of genetic variations, so we talked about kind of the small stuff and how you detect those. Uh, structural variation is another big one, um, you know, where we're talking about um, often very large events, you know, whole genes being moved around, inserted, deleted, translocated, broken. Um, and, uh, and, and Tanser is an example where things can get pretty messy. Um, this is from a paper I worked on back in grad school um, where we sequenced a MTF7 cell line, a breast cancer cell line, and uh, made this pretty circus plot where each one of these lines connecting two chromosomes represents a breakpoint where part of chromosome one is fused to part of chromosome 17 or to part of chromosome nine. So this genome has just been absolutely shattered and, and reassembled, um, and, and yet it's still alive and still kicking. Um, and so um, trying to understand how to deal with that and, and understand the kind of effects that that kind of large scale structural variation can have is, is challenging. And that's one of the places where this long read sequencing is really helping too. Um, it, more simple, you know, kind of things that we've known about for a long time, uh, examples of structural variation in twin against cancer. Uh, probably the canonical example is the BCL, able fusion in uh, CML, um, where the BCL gene and able gene gets um, stuck together and essentially the promoter of one gets stuck to the body of the other. And so you get altered expression and, and that's, you know, is, is uh, strong enough signal to pretty much on its own, one of the few events that can kind of pretty much tip a cell into cancer without other cooperating mutations. It's cool stuff. Um, and, and it's treatable because it's a kind of a simple event. And, and uh, these are the minority in cancer though. Yeah, it's a classic example of a molecular inhibitor. Gleevec, right, is the, is the drug that famously can treat this kind of cancer and, and has a very high success rate. Um, that's still rare, um, but and you know, this was possible because this translocation is visible on a cytogenetic level. Um, I have some slides I don't have with me today about kind of smaller events um, that, that occur, you know, even in these kinds of well understood uh, uh, cytogenetic abnormalities can happen on a much smaller scale, where maybe we don't translocate this whole chromosome arm, but we only take a small chunk of it out containing the ABLE gene and it gets like inserted over by BCL that wouldn't be visible on kind of a gross scale under a cytogenetic uh, spread. And so um, um, being able to detect those is one of the places where uh, sequencing really excels because we can get, you know, base pair resolution of what's going on. And, I, and you know, I don't think cytogenetics honestly is long for this world. Um, underneath all of this, obviously, is a massive kind of informatics challenge, and that's where I spend a lot of my time. Um, and and uh, it pains me a little bit to only give this one slide because it's such a rich and complicated area. Um, but but it's important, um, not just in you know kind of the uh, you know kind of managing a computational cluster and uh, creating pipelines that can automate these complex tasks, which is super important for reproducibility of our research. Um, but just things like, uh, you know, uh, what do we do with these variants after we find them, right? How do we determine that they're in a gene? How do we choose which transcript to assign a particular variant to? Which databases are we going to pull in to annotate our and find out whether this is common or rare in our population of interest? Um, all of these take a, a huge amount of kind of scripting and coding chops. Um, it's an incredible area of growth. Um, you know, anybody who goes into bioinformatics is not going to be hurting for a job among your students. 
Um, and I think uh, forward-looking institutions, even in kind of primarily undergraduate uh, institutions, you know, are working to kind of synthesize lessons across kind of the computational biology, uh, computational side and the biology side and offering things like mathematical biology programs or seminar series. Um, uh, so it's definitely something to keep in mind. I'm not gonna get it too far into it today, but happy to answer questions about it. So all of this, you know, this ability to map reads um, and call variants efficiently, um, it really led us into kind of the discovery phase of cancer genomics, which I think has been happening over the past 10 years or so. I, I kind of think of TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, is kicking this off, um, where they sequenced, you know, over the course of about a decade, sequenced about 10,000 cancers um, and helped really push the technology forward, but also created a massive database of cancer mutations that, that um, allowed for you know, not finding all the answers, but for, you know, generating hypotheses is how I think of a lot of this research. Um, and I like to show this uh, slide from our uh, TCGA paper on AML that came out in, in 2013, um, where, you know, if you look across this pattern, all we did was take the frequently mutated genes and kind of stack them up according to recurrence and, and kind of group them according to some functional significance. And, and just looking at this picture, um, you get so many kind of uh, questions and answers out of it. So it's immediately apparent that all of these transcription factor fusions are completely mutually exclusive. If you have one of them, you don't need the others, right? Um, so that, that tells you something about maybe overlapping function. The same can be said for NRAS and KRAS down here at the bottom. They never co-occur. Um, other, other interesting hypotheses, you know, the FLT3 gene almost always co-occurs with DNMT3A. Why is that? You know, that's something we're still trying to untangle, you know, 10 years later. Um, it's one of the things that we work on. You know, why does this methylation, methyl transferase being altered, you know, cooperate so well with some of these activating signaling mutations? You know, why is epigenetic modification so common? What exactly is altering the histone uh, structure or, or uh, histone marks doing to these genomes that allows them to kind of take off into understrain growth? Um, so, so it's a fascinating um, exercise to dig into this data. Yeah, somebody posted the GC cancer portal, which is a perfect place to start if you want to dig into this data um, and, and start thinking about you know, uh, the interesting patterns here. And, and so really what these kind of large scale sequencing efforts have done is, is generate a ton of hypotheses that are now being followed up on a much smaller scale, one gene at a time. And from there, we were able to accelerate, you know, past single cancer types, but do pan cancer analyses of thousands of tumors. Um, and that, that's really interesting for a number of reasons. First, it's just the wide disparity in what cancer can look like. Um, this is the number of mutations per megabase. So right down here, you see AML is, is kind of at the low end. If we'd sequence an exome, just the coding genes of an AML, we get about I don't know, 30 mutations or so. Whereas in a kind of carcinogen driven lung cancer, we might get 10,000 mutations in genes. And so they're obviously very, very different diseases um, and, and uh, have very different challenges when studying them, uh, when trying to tease out driver versus passenger, as well as just understanding um, the impact of that kind of massive genome disruption. The other thing that's really interesting in kind of a pan cancer analysis is that um, some cancers look more like other cancers than themselves. So some breast cancers look a lot more like, you know, a kidney cancer than they do other breast cancers. And really that all boils down to kind of what the founding events are, what those underlying genomic mutations are that are causing the cancer. And so that's really led the FDA to change their thinking too from one where they approved drugs on kind of a per cancer basis to say, you know, this is a breast cancer drug or this is a kidney cancer drug, but to really say, you know, this is a drug that treats uh, cancers that have this particular mutation or have this particular overexpression of this gene or so on. Um, and, and so that's taken some uh, time to kind of turn that massive ship of regulatory approvals, um, but, but it's really happened over the last four or five years. And we're seeing more kind of pan cancer basket trials that, that cover any kind of cancer that has the relevant mutations. And so where this is all really leading is, is the idea that, you know, to, to truly diagnose cancer and, and understand it well, we have to, um, uh, you know, sequence people, uh, their genomes, their exomes, and understand their expression patterns too. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about 
uh, cytogenetics, and we're quickly seeing sequencing going in as a diagnostic. Um, this was from a paper that our group just published in the uh, NEJM, where um, we're doing rapid turnaround of uh, patients with AML and using it to replace cytogenetics um, and showing that it's more accurate than cytogenetics. Um, and, you know, it was able to classify more patients into kind of risk groups that allow them to get the correct sequence um, and turn it around really rapidly. Um, and this is a story that just came out, I think, last week, um, where uh, a fantastic story from the Rady folks, Rady uh, Children's Hospital in San Diego, where they took a patient, um, a, a newborn that had, you know, um, all sorts of kind of concerning signs. Um, they uh, sequenced it. They took it from blood draw through whole genome sequence to diagnosis and treatment for this thiamine metabolism disorder in 11 hours. And that kid left the hospital three days later, um, something that would have taken weeks, months, maybe never, you know, never been able to be diagnosed accurately, you know, a couple decades ago. So uh, super cool stuff. Uh, don't go to your sequencing core and ask for the 11 hour turnaround right now because that's not common yet. But, um, but uh, you know, using some advanced techniques and some, uh, some custom kits and, and hacking on their machines and stuff, they were able to do it. And, and I think we are moving toward a future where it becomes very, very doable. Um, then this AML study I was talking about, it was more like a weak turnaround, which is actually pretty comparable to common cytogenetics in a lot of cases. Um, I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes just talking about uh, two different applications of, of this. We've talked a little bit about um, uh, uh, kind of tracking patients through therapy. Um, you know, one, one another place where we're kind of replacing diagnosis or cytogenetics is taking uh, monitoring patients. So the idea is that if you go into remission and your cancer cells are no longer detectable, that's probably unsurprisingly um, a good sign. Um, and so we took a cohort of patients where the uh, cytogenetics or the you know, pathologist had looked under the microscope and said, these patients are in remission. I don't see any more cancer cells. Um, and we sequenced them and showed that, unsurprisingly, if the sequencing showed that they had actually cleared all the variants, they do very well and, and typically don't relapse. But if sequencing shows that they still have variants around, well, then they do poorly. Um, and keep in mind that these were patients where um, patients where, you know, the pathology had said they were cleared. And so, yeah, exactly what somebody said, measuring minimal residual disease on a, on a very sensitive scale. And so we're doing a lot of work in kind of that area. Um, another place that, that I'm working on is uh, designing personalized cancer vaccines. So immunotherapy is a whole field of cancer research that just opened up and is enormously promising. It's not a silver bullet, um, but it, it, uh, it's a whole new kind of tool in our arsenal to fight against cancer. Um, and so one thing that we're doing is sequencing the DNA of these patients, doing alignment and variant calling, just like we've talked about, but then predicting what these variants are going to be, uh, uh, what their effects is going to be on the protein level. And so within all our cells, we're constantly chopping up proteins into little peptides, displaying them on the surface of the cells and, you know, asking the immune system, hey, do you recognize this? Is this something that, um, you know, we should attack? Um, and so... Uh, in the same kind of, you know, we've been thinking about vaccines a lot, obviously, in the same way that we can design vaccines against, you know, viruses and stuff, we hope to be able to design uh, vaccines that are priming your immune system to fight off your own cancer cells. Um, and, and these are in clinical trials right now, and, and early stages um, look good. We've still got, we've gotten um, some early results, and the patients in our triple negative breast cancer trial, for example, seem to so far have longer emissions than, than the untreated kind of patients. And so we are... Um, very hopeful that this is going to be a cool technology that, that uh, influences the field. Um, I always like to uh, kind of wrap up with this story because I think it's a fantastic one. This is this is the story of Lucas Wortman. Um, it got a lot of press uh, back in 2012 or so when, when this happened. Um, and he was one of the first patients to really benefit from personalized genomic medicine. Um, he, uh, he was a researcher here at WashU. Um, he was initially diagnosed with ALL at age 25, um, uh, right out of college, um, went into chemotherapy and got, got remission. Uh, uh, but then at age 30, while he was kind of in the middle of doing his uh, uh, med school rotations and stuff, he, uh, or maybe it was his fellowship, either way, um, he relapsed. And that's bad news in ALL. Um, relapses are often 
you know, uh, very poor prognosis, but they were able to you know, kind of using conventional techniques, salvage him, um, you know, knock down the tumor enough that he was eligible for a stem cell transplant and, um, and uh, beat the cancer back into remission. Now, stem cell transplants are, are pretty nasty uh, treatment. They're one of those ones that I hope we look back at as barbaric in 20 years or so. Um, but the idea is basically you kill off a patient's entire bone marrow and replace it with the immune system and the blood of another person. And so then presumably that person, um, not only have you taken out the cells, the leukemia cells that were in the blood, but you're also introducing a new immune system that may recognize that tumor. Um, unfortunately, Lucas had a second relapse then in, in July 2011, age 33, and second relapses are almost unheard of to uh, recover for. It had central nervous system um, involvement. Um, it, it was bad. I, I see in the chat somebody said that 50% mortality was the rule 15 years ago. I think it's down closer to 30, 25, 30% now, but it, it's still not great. The procedure itself, yeah, is massively disruptive. Um, and some of that has to do with the populations, the fact that it's often elderly patients getting these kind of um, leukemias, but um, it's still, it's, it's bad news. So Lucas dropped um, into a second relapse in, in July 2011, and things looked bad. And so this was during the time when kind of sequencing was ramping up. Uh, you know, we had a few whole genomes under our belt at that point in, in MGI. And, uh, and so they decided to pool their money and uh, do some exome sequencing. Um, using some grant funds and stuff. And, and so they sequenced this genome. They found some interesting events, a few translocations, a few mutations, but unfortunately, none of them were kind of druggable. And, and this is honestly still the case in a lot of cancer sequencing that we do. We can maybe tell you exactly why you have cancer, but we can't necessarily prescribe a treatment. So it's going to take some time for kind of that downstream biological workups and, and pharmaceutical development to catch up. Um, one of the things that they were trying to do, though, um, was to use kind of standard chemo to beat them back into remission if they could, because if, again, if you can get somebody into remission and get most of those leukemic cells gone, you can do a stem cell transplant and, and maybe, you know, uh, kick the cancer. But if they still have massive amounts of tumor in their blood, it's just not going to work, is what experience tells them. And so one of the things they did is they used um, the, the knowledge from this whole genome about some of these genomic translocations to design very specific fish probes that could monitor his disease um, in a way that wasn't possible from kind of standard cytogenetics. And they found out that, you know, he wasn't really in remission yet. Some of his blasts had cleared, but one of the deletions was gone, but the kind of major one was still hanging around. Um, and that's where the RNA seq came in. So Malachi Griffith, who still works with us at, at the Genome Center here at WashU, um, you know, took a close look at the RNA seq and saw that one gene in particular, this FLT3 gene, had just off the part charts uh, uh, expression. Uh, massively overexpressed. We still don't know exactly why it was being massively overexpressed. There are some kind of nearby intronic variants that might be important, but regardless of the ultimate cause, it was a druggable gene being massively overexpressed. Um, there's a targeted therapeutic for it, sunitinib, which had been improved in kidney cancer. Um, and, uh, and, you know, even though they weren't able to get insurance to approve it initially, they pulled together the, I don't even know, $100,000 or whatever they had to, to do to get it and got him some doses of this and the uh, and the effect was uh, incredible. It cleared his tumor basically completely um, and they were able to, you know, give him a second stem cell transplant and um, kick him back into relapse. And and so far he's been in remission. Um, it, uh, so 12 days kicked him down into remission. He got a stem cell transplant that September. Um, and almost 10 years later, he's still alive and doing research in the lab down the hall. Um, I won't pretend it's all been, you know, roses because um, the, the treatment is still tough. That stem cell um, transplant means you've got another immune system in, the, in your body. Um, and it means that you often suffer from something called graft versus host disease. So that grafted cells like think a lot of your cells um, should be attacked. It's an autoimmune disorder, essentially. And so he has to um, uh, deal with a lot of complications of that. But that said, he's, um, he's still alive and doing research when his prognosis was dismal at that point. And so um, undoubtedly a, a massive success story, one of the earliest kind of examples of, kind of whole genome sequencing leading to personalized genomic medicine that, that cured cancer. Um, and since then, there have been obviously many, many more examples of this kind of thing, but it's, it's a nice story to tell.
Um, and so that's really what we advocate for, I think, moving forward. And, you know, if I had cancer or one of my loved ones had cancer, I would absolutely advocate for genomic sequencing and RNA sequencing to try to identify these actionable targets. And, and not everyone can make use of that information. Um, and, and sometimes the findings come back negative. You know, we can tell you why you have cancer, but you don't have a drug. But, um, but I think, you know, enabling this for as many people as we can, both to help them directly and also to build up these biobanks of tumors that we can use to, to better um, inform future treatments, is just essential. And it's been really heartening to see over the past five years or so, um, massive tumor sequencing programs take off and, and for insurance to start covering it more and more often and uh, for us to have the kind of um, resources we need to kind of make this personalized genomic medicine a reality.